Uh, just a few books. I could have brought uh, a whole library of books here on this topic. You know, of course, it uh, <coughs> took a long time and so on, a lot of books, but <coughs> some you might be interested in. That. This one, uh, Ron Numbers sent me this uh, copy. You may know Ron Numbers used to be a member of the faculty here and so on, University of Wisconsin now. Uh, and uh, it's caught out, Galileo goes to jail. And then it says, in other myths about science and religion. And it's, it's a compendium. It's uh, I think Harvard University Press uh, of uh, about two dozen false views that have been, I'll be covering several of them in the last in this, uh, uh, as we consider this battle that's been going on about uh, how to get God out of the picture. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's all historians, you know. All history is interesting, some of it's even true. Uh, they say. But uh, uh, in general, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to re-correct what has happened. This one uh, you've heard of before here, if you've been a regular attendant, uh, Anthony Flew, There Is a God. Uh, and that's uh, when did this world-renowned atheist reversed himself, uh, which gets into the question of why uh, in, in this whole issue. Uh, this one here is uh, by Michael Bruce, uh, a very famous writer, uh, philosopher. He was at the Arkansas trial when I was there. Uh, <laughs> that trial and so on, on the opposite side. He was on the opposite side and so on. But uh, it's called The Evolution Creation Struggles. It's a very recent book, uh, Harvard University Press. Uh, gives you a fairly good account, and he, he's, he's an excellent writer. Uh, this one, not such a good writer, in my book, Science Discovers God. Tells you a lot about the data. Uh, we're not going so much into the data issues in this thing. We're going more into uh, looking at the thinking that was going on here. Uh, in, in this uh, controversy, and uh, <coughs> uh, this has been a, a big battle. When science was expelled from the intellectual community, <coughs> uh, the, the idea of a designer has dominated uh, through all our knowledgeable history of human thinking. Of course, uh, uh, paganism came in and so on, but uh, to say there is no God uh, designer has been a minority view. Now, it is there, it's always there. Uh, but it's, uh, the idea of a designer is dominated. Uh, <coughs> but at present, the picture is different in the intellectual community of the world, uh, you don't talk much about God. Uh, and part of it is because it's this secular ethos of science that dominates the thinking. And uh, <coughs> uh, to suggest as a God who's active in nature, well, you believe in miracles and uh, this type of thing, it doesn't uh, uh, carry very much weight with the uh, community, the uh, intellectual community of the world right at present. <coughs> so we're going to look a little bit about when this reversal took place. And uh, it has generated you know, very, very severe controversies. Uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's a battle that uh, uh, isn't something you can easily dismiss because it affects your basic, very basic philosophy, your very basic outlook on life, uh, uh, and the, the meaning of life, and so on. So but this is where we're going on this. Here. Uh, definitions, we have to say a little bit about definitions here, although they're not all that important in the issue. <coughs> but uh, some, uh, at present especially, 
uh, defines science as you know, a study of nature that excludes the metaphysical, the transcendent, the supernatural factors. Uh, in other words, uh, words that uh, are frequently used, uh, science is mechanistic, it's materialistic, it's naturalistic, and then uh, in other words, it's commonly used, it's methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism is you're going to approach nature as though uh, you were just going to be a materialist. Uh, in, in practicality, uh, there's essentially no difference between uh, methodological ma materialism or uh, uh, some what some call philosophical materialism, which is probably more atheistic. The uh, term atheist uh, applies specifically to those who say there is no God. <coughs> Some uh, prefer not to be associated with that view. Uh, they say, many say that there is a God, but he's not active in nature now. Uh, all kinds of ideas out there uh, in this uh, complicated question. But one of the basic things you can state <coughs> when someone says to you, well, you're not a scientist uh, because uh, you're not, uh, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, God and so on. Science, science deals with the materialist uh, view and so on. Well, uh, keep in mind that Isaac Newton, for instance, Kepler, Boyle, Islamic scientists, and so on. These folks all believed in God. And you'd have to say, well, uh, Newton was not a scientist. Uh, and uh, this, this, of course, is uh, blasphemy almost. Uh, the man who really put rigor into science, uh, changed the whole picture, is Isaac Newton. Uh, so uh, keep in mind these changes. Uh, uh, these folks felt sure that the God, God created nature. There's consistency in nature. Mathematics works with nature and so on. Uh, God designed all this. You don't have to exclude God to be a good scientist. In fact, some of our greatest scientists believed in God active in nature, uh, like these uh, scientists. We'll get to that again. <clears throat> Actually, the, the term scientist originated, as far as we can tell from the Oxford Dictionary, 1834, uh, term for designating those that studied nature. Uh, it replaced terms like natural historian, which was largely for biologists, uh, some claim anyway, natural philosophers for the physical scientists, the chemists and the, the physicists and so on, uh, that were used earlier. So that term came in, you know, during a very vital time. And uh, you need to keep in mind, uh, some, when some say, well, this is not science, how do, what do we mean by the term science? Uh, do we include Newton and, the, and historians of science and others who invariably talk of science way beyond, way back, uh, beyond the uh, date uh, 1834, you know, they talk about modern science starts five, five centuries ago, uh, Islamic science way before that. Uh, and uh, uh, Greek science uh, uh, before that and so on, so that uh, uh, keep in mind, you've got to define that term science. As it's commonly used, uh, it's the way we'll use it here. It applies to those who study nature, not necessarily a materialistic philosophy that excludes God. But that's the way some scientists uh, describe it, and we'll talk about that this week, next week, <coughs> a little later. The, uh, <coughs> uh, so, uh, 
keep that in mind. You, you can, what we are interested in is what did those who were studying nature say about God, uh, regardless of how you want to define science. But we're going to use the general and most commonly used definition of science, and that is science is, it, science is the study of nature. <coughs> And uh, so, uh, keep that in mind. That definition in mind as we look further. Just early history. Uh, it's interesting what we have. Uh, ancient civilizations. Uh, of course, you know the <coughs> Israelites uh, believed in God, but they also uh, idolatry used to slip in. Other gods used to slip in, and so on. Quite often, uh, <coughs> we had varied views. God dominates very much so. Many gods, one god, uh, some no personal god, some esoteric views, uh, uh, yin yang and so on, these oriental uh, uh, religions and so on. But there's a, about four centuries before Christ, an interesting group adopted a rather modern approach to science. Uh, that is the Ionian or Militian School. Uh, they were in the Aegean region, and uh, uh, they had uh, this worldly, naturalistic approach. They were not going to go beyond what they saw, or, or uh, <coughs> could uh, deduce closely to that. Uh, secularization of the elements, the elements were sacred. No, Everything was secular. This was a, a strongly secular approach. Uh, Thales, uh, one of the leaders in that group, uh, suggested that water was the basic element and so on. And Isagoras, uh, interestingly, said, said to have been expelled for, from Athens for impiety. Uh, these folks were a little bit to the east uh, of uh, Athens, Greece, and so on, and around where Turkey is now, that, that Aegean area. Uh, but uh, interestingly, that uh, he was asked to leave Athens because he was not religious. It's because of impiety. He was not pious enough. <coughs> and uh, perhaps most interesting in the battle, as far as biology is concerned, is that as in Pentecles in Sicily about that same time. And he uh, held that biological evolution came about through the random combination of organs. Uh, not a very workable model, you understand. But note this. And then the elimination of, unfit, of the unfit for survival. This is getting right into Darwin's survival of the fittest. Uh, very interesting that that idea was uh, there uh, a couple thousand uh, years earlier <coughs> than, than Darwin. Anyway, uh, <coughs> then we have the classical language. Uh, <coughs> Socrates, he was uh, skeptical in ways, uh, but he, he had a very astute method of asking questions and so on, so as to induce uh, uh, more basic information type of highly respected, but uh, as you know, he was asked to drink hemlock. Uh, he was put to death uh, in Athens uh, for, again, impiety. Uh, <coughs> Plato, uh, reality is, is the ideas, uh, not matter. Matter was not that important. That's so different than what we have right at present. Then Aristotle followed Plato, but Aristotle did a lot of biology and so on and so forth. He was not a, uh, a pure abstract uh, thinker or per se, but all very much believed in some kind of God uh, as a prime mover. Aristotle believed that the earth was all, had always existed, a rather interesting uh, challenge to the creation account, of course. Um, Plato and Aristotle believed in a great flood. Uh, and about a couple thousand 
years earlier, uh, <laughs> at least, uh, I'd say a thousand years, maybe a little over 1,200 years later, later earlier, uh, we had the Gilgamesh epic, a very famous story about the flood and so on. Uh, uh, in the classical antiquity, they very much believed in that flood. They referred to it in their writings uh, uh, repeatedly. Then we come to the Middle Ages, and we have uh, <coughs> the not-so-dark ages. Uh, people like to talk about this terrible time there in the Dark Ages. And, uh, but then, of course, other historians say, well, they weren't so dark, uh, and so on. And uh, there was a lot of good thinking going on at that time. Uh, but it was different than our thinking. Uh, scholasticism is the name for, for the, uh, the, the ethos at that time. Many schools under church sponsorship. Uh, universities were founded during that time. Quite a number of important universities were founded. Charlemagne, you may have heard of the French. He was very uh, interested in promoting education. Uh, but the emphasis was on rhetoric, grammar, logic, respect for authority, especially Aristotle's and the church's authority, uh, came in there also. Uh, and science is not so strong, except for Islamic science, uh, which contributed something to science uh, at that time. Uh, alchemy and the Inquisition also, I can don't think this was a perfect world uh, during the Middle Ages, because we have uh, conflicting ideas and ideas that uh, we would definitely say are not good. But uh, it was a different mode of thinking with uh, respect for authority, uh, among other things, that uh, caused later trouble. <coughs> Islamic science, I just might mention, uh, they did significant work. It wasn't all that much compared to modern science, and it's quite different. Uh, we now have 50 million scientific papers available. 50 million. Uh, Islamic science, you know, just barely contributed, just very few of those, uh, <coughs> per se. Uh, modern science is, is uh, much, much more productive. Um, it is derived from many countries. It's not just uh, the Arabic world. The, uh, you have Greece, India, China. Uh, dominated from the 8th through the 16th centuries. Uh, probably the 16th is a little optimistic, more like the 14th and 12th. But <coughs> strong loyalty to God. This was not secular science as we have it now. <coughs> Allah is important. Uh, especially emphasized libraries, translation. They helped uh, the distribution of a lot of the scholarly literature at that time. Uh, hospitals, important. Uh, they had leading anatomists. Uh, observatories, astronomy, and so on. Mathematics involved in it. And also alchemy that wasn't all that good. Uh, based on uh, highly questionable premises. Uh, then we have the Renaissance. Uh, this is uh, when things begin to change in Europe. <coughs> Europe wakes up. Uh, probably 15th century is a better date for the Renaissance, but it started in the middle of the 14th. Started in Italy, started with art and writing. Uh, then comes the Reformation against the uh, Catholic Church. Protestant Church comes into the, and turmoil uh, starts over the European uh, Western world, actually, not just Europe. Uh, and so uh, we, we have this uh, turmoil here as a result of this, of this Renaissance. And, uh, interesting things began to happen. This is when modern science starts up. And uh, belief in the God whose active nature was a dominant ID as the foundations of modern science were laid down. 
Uh, scientific leaders at that time included well-known scientists such as Copernicus, who uh, suggested that the uh, Earth goes around the sun instead of everything going around the Earth. <coughs> Johannes Kepler, uh, they did wonderful work. That he, he's the one who discovered that hey, planets don't go around in a circle; they go around in an oval. Uh, Galileo, well, he, he uh, was very good at mathematics and, and so on, and uh, got in trouble with the church a little bit over the question of. Uh, the heliocentricity or the geocentricity of the Earth. <coughs> Robert Boyle, uh, considered the father of uh, physical chemistry and so on. Uh, uh, Boyle's law, you've heard of that. Newton, you've heard of his laws also. You've heard of Kepler's laws. I mean, these folks established the basic laws of the science that we have now. Uh, they've been modified a little bit and so on and so forth. but. Uh, uh, and these folks, uh, Linnaeus, classification of organisms, uh, we still use now, although uh, cladistics tries to challenge that at times. <coughs> but uh, these pioneers of science, established science, they did it in a very theistic concept, uh, context. They were devout believers in God believing that God had created the laws of nature, that made the study of science possible, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and so on. And they, uh, they felt God and science, a very compatible concept, that God had created science. Uh, to show you the devoutness of some of these folks, uh, uh, there's a statement by John Kepler as he writes in a, a prayerful context here, but it tells you a little bit about his uh, feeling. He, he, these are not atheistic ideas, folks. He says, if I have ever been allured into brashness by the wonderful beauty of thy works, or if I have loved my own glory among men, while advancing in work destined for thy glory, gently and mercifully pardon me. He's talking to God here. <clears throat> and finally, deign graciously to cause that these demonstrations may lead to the glory and to the salvation of souls and nowhere be an obstacle to that. So, uh, no question this man believes in God. Uh, Newton, you know, his uh, seminal product was Principia, uh, strongly mathematical uh, interpretation of astronomy and gravity and so on and so on. Uh, in the second edition, he, he added this uh, scholium, and uh, he states there, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets, could only proceed from the counsel and dominance of an intelligent and powerful being. There's no question Newton believed in God and a God that is active in nature. Well, uh, then comes the Enlightenment. Uh, perhaps one of the greatest misnomers in history. Uh, it was not very enlightening. Terrible time that developed here, uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, but uh, Kant described it you know, as freedom to use one's own intelligence. Uh, it was a strong reaction uh, against political and religious authority. It was characterized by empiricism, scientific rigor. The, um, the scientists you know, had just come in and uh, they were talking quantitative science and so on. The rigor was coming into the picture, alchemy was uh, being downgraded and pure chemistry was coming up. Uh, <clears throat> rebellion and reductionism. Uh, reductionism is where you try to simplify your thing. Uh, it's a basic philosophy uh, where you, 
it tends to push you into materialism where you think well, it just matter is the only thing that's, that's important and uh, motion and, and, and uh, motion and matter and you explain everything on the basis of those two forces uh, two, two uh, factors uh, in France uh, <coughs> led the way to the, the famous encyclopédie and uh, <coughs> this is part of that turmoil this was after the Reformation, uh, but there's a great deal of intellectual uh, uh, turmoil there. Uh, the Encyclopédie was edited by uh, Diderot, uh, Ron d'Alembert, with contributions of hundreds, including Voltaire, Rousseau, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, and that, that it was a, a set of 35 volumes, folks. Uh, 25,000 copies. At that time, 25,000 copies, you know, just beyond uh, belief almost. I mean, uh, some of these things ended up here in the United States. Uh, Jefferson, uh, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, are said to have been affected by the encyclopedia. Uh, it was not just something in France. All right. Went all over the world. Uh, so, uh, and uh, you know, this is uh, basically it was a rebellion against authority. Actually, uh, the church uh, and the uh, monarchs were trying to be uh, absolute in their control of things, and uh, this is. Uh, a reaction against it. Uh, I suppose we could mention Delametri. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the thinking at that time in general. <coughs> Delametri, uh, one of the most uh, notorious writers of that time, uh, 75, 751. He was an atheist, a hedonist. He just wanted pleasure, per se. Uh, and he successfully irritated most of his readers. And then uh, the mantra around there was, uh, to be happy, you should not read La Métrie. Well, uh, he writes a book, Histoire naturelle de l'âme, uh, the Natural History of the Soul, uh, which you know, uh, was a mechanistic view of thought. And, you know, this kind of puts out God and anything mysterious so on. And he, down to this materialistic uh, thoughts. Thought. Well, uh, people didn't like his book at all. He burned it and they chased him out of France. He had to go to Holland. So he writes another book, L'homme machine, the, the human machine. Again, a mechanistic approach uh, to this. And he, he says uh, the soul is not separate from the body or something we Seventh-day Adventists might relate to in ways, uh, in contrast to what the church was teaching then. But again, his books were burned, told him to get out. He, he fled to Prussia, uh, was accepted there for a while. Uh, but even Diderot and Voltaire of the Encyclopedia would not endorse uh, Lametri. They felt he was so extreme. So uh, it's not a sharp, clear picture here, but the trends are definite. <coughs> well, uh, then comes in the French Revolution. Uh, it tells you a little bit about what happens when you uh, uh, have intellectual anarchy. <coughs> uh, it involves other countries in France, incidentally. <coughs> Just a, the famous reign of terror during that revolution. Things were out of control. Uh, 16,000 to 40,000 were executed, 300,000 were arrested. A quite a number of them died in prison. Uh, some were killed by being put uh, fixed on uh, fixed objects at low tide, now allowing the tide to rise up and uh, suffocate them and so on. It was uh, Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette from Austria uh, were executed by the guillotine during that time. I mean, this was a time of chaos. Uh, this is uh, French Revolution generally attributed to the oppression by monarchy and the church and the liberation thinking of the Enlightenment. 
And uh, L'Encyclopédie, of course, had a big part in that thing. Um, so after that, people were tired of all this, uh, this period of romanticism uh, occurred. There was a revival in religion after all this secularism uh, uh, that had been proposed here. Uh, a revival of religion, it did not last all that long. But uh, people did not like the, uh, the uh, intellectual and political uh, anarchy a national anarchy that was going on uh, during this uh, very significant period. I mean, this uh, can suggest where uh, things can go uh, when you have uh, no control, no values, uh, no absolutes. Anyway, uh, during this time, evolution reappears, but not among the biologists, or as you'd expect. It appears uh, in the uh, philosophers. Uh, Dampier, Sir William Dampier, in his famous book, A History of Science, so he, he says, hence it is in the nature of the case that when in the revival of learning, the idea of evolution once more appears to be found chiefly in the writings and philosophers, <coughs> Roger Bacon, Descartes, Leibniz, and Kant. Evolution reappears here, but it's, in the philo it's not the science that's pushing it, it's the philosophy that's pushing it. Uh, of course, this is a little bit in fit with all this enlightenment uh, thing. Uh, <coughs> uh, and <coughs> but keep in mind, the dominant idea among the scientists uh, was Hey, recent creation by God, the Bible, Genesis, the flood, and so on. Uh, notable exception, Buffon, uh, around 1750. Uh, he he uh, proposed, uh, well, now we need much more time here, and uh, uh, changes in organisms and so on a little bit. Uh, he, he did not follow the Bible at all, but his views were not accepted uh, in general. Uh, so we come here to, to uh, <coughs> uh, this period where we, we, we still have a, a dominant view, biblical view in, in Western thought, <coughs> very dominant. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, catastrophism uh, starts entering into the picture here at this, this time of turmoil here. Uh, <coughs> Sir's question started. Uh, with the Renaissance about, they believed the flood, yeah, <coughs> sure, they believed. but what caused it? And then there are endless discussions about the marine fossils up in high in the Alps, and, uh, and endless discussions about <coughs> huge boulders in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, some of you have seen those. Uh, scores of miles away from where they're, and the uh, farmers were correct. They said, no, it came from there. Geologists said, no, that could not happen, uh, type of thing, and so on. And the farmers went out on that argument. Uh, then James Hutton comes on the scene. James a Scottish geologist. Uh, 1875, he wrote The Theory of the Earth. Listen to, he's getting, now he's proposing mechanistic views, materialistic views, and so on, he says. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those in which we know the principle. Okay. Don't bother me with the supernatural, is what he's saying here. Then he asks, what more can we require? Nothing but time. Hey, don't bother me with creation or the end of the world or those biblical things. <coughs> Flood. That might cause major changes. No, no, it's all out. Just give us a lot of time. And uh, things are going on slow right now. Uh, and therefore, they must have gone on slow before. Although well, that's an assumption that you uh, should not make. Uh, <coughs> and then another thing he said, the result, therefore, of our present inquiry is that we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, no creation. Uh, uh, you know, hit pretty hard at the Bible. Some say uh, that um, 
Hutton was, was a pious man and so on, but he certainly uh, did not believe in the biblical account of beginnings. Okay, we come to the 19th century. <coughs> uh, this is the important century in this whole change that took place, 19th century. Uh, right very early we have in France again, uh, Chevalier de Lamarck, uh, who proposes Lamarck and <coughs> for evolution and so on. Uh, in other words, this wasn't creation of different types by God. Uh, this was a change by usage uh, of a deer who uh, kept wanting to get more leaves off a tree, would stretch his neck out, and uh, it, his neck would uh, then probably be a little bit longer, but he, slow changes, but uh, this would be passed on to the offspring. And uh, so on. Well, generally acquired characteristics are not passed on to the offspring, although they're there's some good data that uh, says just the opposite. Uh, but in general, his views again are not accepted. Well, we come into uh, <coughs> Charles Lyell. This person probably did more than anybody else to change the general view of the scientific world towards materialism. Uh, and he did it by <coughs> this book, Principles of Geology, <coughs> and he, he spoke strongly about uniformitarianism. That is, hey, uh, we don't have a lot of catastrophes here. This gets rid of the flood. You just have slow changes. Uh, went through 11 editions, and he called it a polemic to sink the diluvialist. You get the, you get where he's going. Uh, just a a little humor here about uh, diluvialists are those who believe in the flood. Uh, and so uh, he, he was going to, <coughs> he's going to sink them. Uh, some interesting uh, <coughs> uh, machining that went on to, to get that book to be popular. Uh, this is a, a letter that uh <coughs> Lyle wrote to, to his friend Scroop. Uh, and this is just before they're getting the book published. He says, if we don't irritate, now Lyle was a lawyer, and he, he knew how to handle society to a certain extent. He said, if we don't irritate, which I fear we may, we shall carry all with us. He said, if you don't triumph over them, but compliment the liberality <coughs> excuse me, and candor of the present age, the bishops and enlightened saints will join us in despising both the ancient and modern physiotheologians. Now you see, you use compliment uh, uh, to, to uh, Tell me, like, hey, uh, your way, uh, the liberals and so on, they, your way is great and so on. He's using that method here to convince uh, people and so on. <coughs> then he goes on to say, uh, the bishops and enlightened saints, uh, you have to understand, his, uh, this is a private letter, uh, his uh, humor a little bit here will join us in despising both the ancient and modern physiotheologians, those being the conservatives. So you have the liberality uh, on one side and then the conservatives on the other. He says, it's just time to strike, so rejoice that sinner as you are. Again, uh, a little of cynicism or humor there, if you want to call it that. Uh, the quarterly review, he was going to write uh, Scrope was going to write a, a, quarter, a review of this book. It's open to you. If Murray, he's the publisher of the book, uh, has to publish my volumes and you yield the geology of the qu quarterly review, we shall be able to, sh in a short while, to work an entire change in public opinion. And it worked. Uh, not entirely the public opinion at all. It certainly did work a change in the scientific community. 
So we, we have this uh, principles of geology. It's advocating very slow changes, gets rid of the flood, uh, no consideration of creation and uh, recent creation or anything like that. Uh, uh, Gould, uh, not spend much time on that. He, Gould takes just the opposite view, <laughs> incidentally, because Gould was favoring catastrophism when he wanted to uh, uh, promote his punctuated equilibrium idea, which he felt uh, it's not smooth changes as you'd want for uniformitarianism. Uh, so keep in mind, scientists change their views on these things, but this was much later that uh, Gould did this. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, note, then some major changes took place. This is probably what uh, uh, affected so much the change, or at least uh, stimulated the starting of the change. Uh, this is in the uh, 1920s, I mean 1820s, 1830s. Uh, <clears throat> France Cuvier, a uh, very famous anatomist, he advocated catastrophes and the uh, Genesis flood was the last great catastrophe, uh, but he uh, was advocating a long time here. Now, uh, Conibert, uh, England, he, these are geologists, these, these other three here are geologists. <coughs> uh, he gave a statement, strongly believed in the flood, later, changed some of his views. Buckland, another geologist, Oxford. Uh, I believe Lyle was one of his students, evidently. Uh, dynamically defended the flood. Yeah, Lyle was a student. Later did not invoke uh, flood uh, in the Natural Theology Compendium known as Bridgewater Treatises, which uh, we can discuss those later if you want to. Uh, they were not very significant, but they were supposed to promote a design. Uh, Earl of Bridgewater uh, commissioned these various studies. Uh, and uh, Buckland, uh, by the time he wrote this, this was probably in the 30s, 1830s, uh, did not even mention the flood. Adam Sedgwick. A uh, very prominent uh, figure in this whole thing. Uh, he was at Cambridge, geology professor, Darwin's geology professor, incidentally. <coughs> he supported the diluvialism, the flood, and so on. Later recanted because he could not find fossil men in the lower layers. Right. So he, uh, he gave up because man was not found there in, in the fossil layers says mosaic flood only caused superficial gravels. <coughs> he still opposed Darwin very much uh, all his life. Uh, but he gave up on the flood. Uniformitarianism won, uh, not as a result of just this, but uh, to a certain extent in geology, th this, the battle was somewhat settled here. Uh, when these authorities gave up. Then uh, catastrophism became a dirty word. Uh, for 130 years, you could not uh, deal with that. We'll deal a little bit with the change back to catastrophism next week. <coughs> then uh, an interesting book came out, an anonymous, anonymous book. Uh, and it was called uh, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Nobody knew who had written it. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but uh, they kept it secret. Just the writer and the publisher kept it secret. Uh, but uh, it had a, a tremendous influence. Came out in 1844, interesting date. Uh, and uh, he refers to, to a divine author, but he talks about uh, Evolution from lower forms, the universe evolved from simpler things. Uh, it was progress, progress, progress. Uh, 
And the thing was much more popular in Darwin's Origin of Species, incidentally. It went through 12 editions, 10,000 copies, tremendous distribution for that time. Uh, he was criticized by orthodox clergymen, as you'd expect, because this, this you know, challenged the Bible very much so. And uh, scientists didn't like it because it wasn't very rigorous. Uh, but it was very popular. And it, it laid the ground for the establishment of, uh, or the acceptance of Darwin's origin of species. This is 1844, origin of species came up in 1859. Uh, but just might mention 1844, this is when we had the great disappointment, and soon followed by the Sabbath. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, I believe Bates started keeping the Sabbath in 1845, and Ellen White and uh, James White started keeping it in 1846. <laughs> and that Sabbath makes a tremendous message, uh, because you keep that day sacred because you respect the creation account. It's a memorial of creation, six days. Uh, and so it's, it's been suggested, uh, I tend to be sympathetic to this view, I can't prove it, that it was, it was no random happenstance that the Sunday Adventist Church came into existence at about the same time that evolution started becoming a worldview. And uh, Chambers' uh, uh, book, uh, he remained on honest. It, 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 his name came out after he died, who he was, and so on. But he didn't want to face the flock. And uh, <clears throat> he wrote Chambers' Encyclopedia, if you ever heard of Chambers' Encyclopedia, uh, a very famous uh, book, and so on. Uh, so we have this, this uh, conflict starting right here. And then we go on here, <clears throat> Origin of Species. Probably, probably the most significant uh, step in this, but the ground had been laid before for its success by Charles Darwin and so on, and uh, we didn't go into the details of this. Uh, but keep in mind, Darwin in the last sentence in The Origin of Species talks about the creator breathing a breath of life into the first organisms. Uh, Darwin was not at that time a, an atheist, uh, per se. Uh, he did talk about uh, life originally by itself later on and so on, but uh, in fact, some uh, last year of Darwin's life, some atheists came to him, you know, and they were just, you know, uh, spread everything. He, he took an agnostic view. He said, no, we don't know, we don't know. But uh, he laid the ground for pure materialism, get rid of God, and uh, a mechanistic view of science and so on. This is all uh, fulminating here. Uh, some geologists had already uh, uh, laid some ideas that the Bible wasn't quite correct on the creation and the flood, and uh, <coughs> so on. Uh, Sedgwick did not like the thing at all. Uh, he says, <coughs> he wrote to Darwin right after, the, right after the book came out, he wrote to Darwin and he told him <coughs> that you have deserted the true method of induction and started a machinery as wild as Bishop Wilkins' locomotive to the moon. In other words, hey, you're just speculating. Well, uh, there's some truth to that. Sedgwick, that was uh, Darwin's uh, geology professor, you know. <coughs> well, uh, then, then we have this Wilberforce Huxley uh, confrontation that, that's quite instructive, actually, uh, as to what happened is at Oxford University. Uh, Bishop Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford, uh, and uh, Thomas Huxley uh, had this confrontation. Uh, this was the year after Darwin's um, Origin of Species came out. The, uh, so they, they, had this, they were discussing this. And uh, the, the apocryphal story 
uh, is that the bishop turned to Huxley and said, well now, uh, which uh, of your ancestors uh, was a nape? Was it on your mother's side or your father's side? And uh, Huxley is supposed to have said to his friend right next to him, the Lord has delivered the bishop into my hands. So when Huxley got up to, to make his speech in reply to this, uh, he said, I'd much rather be associated with an honest ape than with a church leader who dishonestly represents the truth, I mean, uh, yeah, well, misrepresents the truth in order to get his points across, referring, of course, to, to the bishop. Well, uh, apparently, this is the embellished story. It's a story, it got its life of its own. It's gone all over the world. I mean, it's repeated many, many times, books, TV programs about it, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, historians, a couple of them, you find one of them in, the, in this book, uh, my numbers there, they, they say, hey, uh, we don't know what happened. Nobody knows what happened uh, at that thing. But it apparently, according to some historians at least, uh, one at Oxford University where this took place, uh, says, uh, no, uh, the bishop never did address Huxley. He just made a general comment to that effect. So, uh, and they, they, apparently there's some evidence uh, that Huxley, uh, when he reported on this story, he embellished it quite a bit uh, so that he had a victory and so on. But the, uh, you get a picture here of, of the milieu here. Uh, the audience largely probably in favor of the bishop uh, because evolution is just the year after the origin of species had come out. <coughs> was much debated, not generally uh, accepted. Well, uh, now we have the scientist, the young guard, their science is just making all kinds of discoveries, it's all kinds of fossils being found, uh, uh, and so on, uh, Charles Darwin, origin of species, and so on. Uh, they're starting to gain power. John Tyndall, a very famous scientist, uh, wrote, what, how many, how many books? Uh, uh, <coughs> A dozen, a dozen science books and so on. Uh, he's given his speech in Belfast, in Ireland, uh, and here's what he declared. <coughs> uh, men of science, he's speaking of men of science here, they shall wrest from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory, all schemes and systems which infringe upon the domain of science must, in so far as they do this, submit to its control and relinquish all thought of controlling it. Uh, this was, you know, uh, the church had been in charge. Uh, and you hear, hear the, the scientists say, hey, we're in charge of truth. You aren't. <coughs> uh, people were furious. He later apologized for the statement. Uh, but you look at the figures uh, of who were the leaders in the uh, Royal Society, Scientific uh, Society, the British Association for Advancement of Science. Look there. The leaders uh, in the early part of the century, they were all, uh, almost all, uh, bishops. When you get to the latter half of the century, after Darwin's origin of species, very few of them, if any, of them are in charge of the scientific groups, scientific societies. The clergy was excluded from the uh, scientific, uh, at least the leadership in the scientific community. But, so the change is coming. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's effectively done by now. <coughs> uh, we can go on here with uh, in the United States. 
Uh, I must uh, briefly go over this and not give you all the details uh, because of time. But we had uh, Draper, president of uh, New York Medical School, a uh, very prominent scientist, uh, uh, who, wrote, who wrote this book that it was an anti-church book, actually. Uh, and it, uh, <coughs> the history of the conflict between religion and science became extremely popular. 15 print, print worldly, uh, 1973, worldwide, uh, that's in 19, 1873, <coughs> worldwide uh, trans translations. He used the flat earth fallacy to say, well, the church, the church believes in the flat earth, you can't believe in the church. This is a manufactured lie. Um, Andrews Dickinson White, uh, first president of Cornell University, Leonard, uh, the, uh, uh, they say the first secular university in the United States. Uh, he, he wrote this book, A History of the Warfare of Science with <coughs> Christendom, 1896. And again, he refers to the flat earth theory as a terror among sailors and so on. This is totally false. The church never believed that. There were a few people who believed it. Uh, but uh, to try and deprecate the church for something that is false uh, is not good history. Uh, it does suggest, hey, there's an agenda here somewhere. But we'll get into that next week. Uh, the, if you want a good reference on it, uh, Jeffrey Burton Russell's on you inventing the flat earth, and so on. He, professor of history, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, he says the curious result is that White and his colleagues, uh, <coughs> that would be Draper, ended by doing what they accused the church fathers of namely creating a body of false knowledge by consulting one another instead of the evidence. So they cooked up this story and it's had a tremendous influence in the United States. Uh, the book, their books are both very popular. Uh, and then we got uh, Heckel's Embryos, uh, 1874, Ernest Heckel. Uh, he provided illustrations of eight different vertebrate embryos, look very similar. This is in Germany. <coughs> uh, and there were all kinds of problems with those embryos. Uh, but he made them all look alike uh, by his drawings. Uh, let me show you here. Uh, and at the top row that you see across there, that's, that's the Heckel's embryos. Uh, at a stage when he said they're all similar, this means they all had one stage. You, you've heard the story, we, we, we have a fish stage and so on. It's, it's this story, which is generally not accepted by embryologists now at all. Uh, the genes and the thing uh, give a whole different picture. It's, uh, there's no fish stage genetically in, in, uh, as you go through the developmental process. But, uh, and you have more advanced stages. Down here at the left, you've got a, a fish embryo <coughs> at the top. Uh, next one over is a salamander. A turtle is the next. Uh, a chick, a chicken. Uh, the next one, uh, Next one's a pig, and uh, I, I think cow, a cow and uh, a rabbit, yeah. and man, and so on. And we all have this similar stage. Well, uh, this has been in textbooks for years and years and years, as we've mentioned before. And uh, just to show you one example, of the, the chick, for instance, I, I taught embryology for a number of years, and. Uh, I always wondered about these drawings because I, hey, heck, he left the heart off that thing. It's a rather important organ. But anyway, it's a lot worse than that. Uh, article has come out recently, you know, that uh, Richardson 
in England and uh, six other scientists uh, pointed out all these errors there are in, in Heckel's embryo. But this is just one example. <coughs> the the um, tail bud stage, which he has there in his diagram. Uh, at the left is his version. At the right, you see the actual version. They're not at all that similar. And when you get earlier, they're much, much, much different. And you get later on, they're much, much different. Uh, so that, uh, well, the, 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 the conclusions aren't very good about this, evaluations. <coughs> uh, Richardson, for, for instance, he says, our survey seriously undermines the credibility of Heckel's drawings. Yeah, well, that's an understatement. Uh, Elizabeth Penis uh, in the journal Science, she quotes Richardson, says it looks like it's turning to be one of the most famous fakes in biology. Folks, this isn't at the time when this whole idea of getting God out of the picture is, is, is fulminating. <coughs> Even Stephen J. J. Gould. Uh, he states, the early embryonic stages of vertebrates are not nearly so similar as Heckel's phony drawings have led us to believe. And uh, <coughs> Gould goes on to say, that Heckel's expert contemporaries recognized what, had, what he had done and said so in print. And still, the pictures keep being reproduced in modern textbooks. Uh, Jonathan Wells, uh, th th this tells you something. Uh, this is not objective analysis here. Uh, we're getting rid of God here by uh, uh, emphasizing certain things here. Uh, uh, Jonathan Wells, he has this book, um, Icons of Evolution, and he evaluates 10 textbooks in that. And one of the icons is Heckel's uh, embryos. Well, in eight of those textbooks, he rated Heckel's embryos as F. The F category means that they use Heckel's drawings as evidence for common ancestry. Just, this is in 2000 when he did this study. Uh, two, he rated it as D, he studied 10, <coughs> where they use actual photos, and I, I've seen some of these pictures where they use actual photos, uh, which is a little better than those diagrams all look the same, but uh, the organisms don't look that way at all. Uh, but th th this is uh, where it's being recognized, and uh, mitigation of that argument is, is beginning to rescind, but you know, this is long after God had been excluded from science. Well, <coughs> Thomas Huxley, uh, note this. Uh, very brilliant, intelligent. He's the guy that argued with Wilberforce, you may have mentioned earlier. <coughs> uh, he, he's writing here about, uh, this is back in 1893. Uh, no, notice how he discusses this, and I hope you see the humor here, because uh, it's kind of cynical. <clears throat> he says, Elijah's great question, will you serve God or Baal? Choose ye is uttered audibly enough in the ears of every one of us as we come to manhood. Right. He's heard this and, you know, and <clears throat> as you grow up. Let every man who tries to answer it seriously ask himself whether he can be satisfied with the bail of authority. Notice what he's doing. He's calling the authority of the church a bail, which is, you know, just the opposite of that story of Elijah <coughs> and so on. And with all the good things his worshipers are promised, you know, all this, oh, you have eternal life and so on. Is ridiculing this in this world and the next. <clears throat> if he can let him, if it be so inclined, amuse himself with such scientific implements as authority, the church you know, tells him are safe and will not cut his fingers. He's accusing the church people of being scared and all this stuff. He's the brave uh, leader not worried about God uh, type of thing. He's his own uh, architect and so on. 
Well, but note this, let him not imagine he is or can be both a true son of the church and a loyal soldier of science. You cannot be both religious and a scientist, is what he's saying. He wants to limit the scope of inquiry just to materialism. That's what he's saying in doing that. You can't be both. Well, you know, Newton's out of the window. Uh, Kepler's out of the window. Um, Boyle, so on and so forth, uh, if you follow that particular principle. So th this is, this is where, where, where it's going right now. <coughs> 20th century. Uh, it's, I must tell you, it is time to tell you that uh, she wanted to go to another service. It's 1033. Uh, 20th century, we will we'll take up next week, but I do want to get to a, uh, a concluding uh, uh, statement here. I'll talk a little bit more about the, this controversy here in uh, Scope's trial and so on, but uh, leave you with this thought. As I've looked at this picture, what happened, the Enlightenment, uh, the uh, getting rid of God and so on, and the results of what happens when you have no absolutes, uh, this text come, kept coming to my mind. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. We need absolutes. Uh, without absolutes, I don't think man is able to produce a cogent system that works. And of course, we know we're facing a serious integrity problem in our society at present. You don't know if anybody's telling the truth anymore or not. Uh, it's acceptable to, you know, to, uh, without, of our truth, reason goes out the window. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I think we can be so thankful that uh, we have some absolutes, and it's good evidence that we need that we need these these absolutes. Well, uh, we'll go on with this story next week to consider uh, the very delicate questions. Is there an agenda here? And uh, the tougher question, why? Why has this, why, why would science reduce its horizon to eliminate God? You don't find truth by cutting out possibilities. Why? We'll, we'll get at that question. Okay, any, any uh, questions now, or do you want to discuss any, any points at present about uh, here are some. You want to? That's uh, been a very interesting uh, survey of the history of scientific thought from antiquity to the present, and I think you've done a good job of concision there. Uh, but, and particularly when you turn to the question of how does it interface with belief in God, I think it's very important to notice that you can't talk meaningfully about whether a scientist believes in God or not until you, know, until you define what kind of God it is that he does or does not believe in. Uh, and uh, belief in God has been as much of a spectrum over this same period of time you're talking mm -hmm. about as science has. In other words, opinions about God among theologians mm -hmm. has been just as various as scientific theories have been over that same period, uh, ranging all the way from very anthropomorphic concepts. God is a kind of giant wizard of Oz in the sky who does magic, mm -hmm. uh, down to where he's identical with the laws of nature or identical with evolution or whatever, and all kinds of beliefs in between. <coughs> uh, in fact, it's not a simple question, but do you believe in God or don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a spectrum, and you've got to find where you fall on that spectrum. In between those two extremes, you have hybrids that are hard to define, like uh, 
pantheism, for instance, which identifies God with nature. Is that believing in God or not? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly you have in the 20th century uh, someone like Tillard de Chardin, a Catholic priest, and at the same time he seemingly identifies God with ca cosmic evolution. So I think really uh, this question needs to be examined in the light of a spectrum, not mm -hmm. just a dichotomy. Yeah. Uh, science is believes in God or science does not. You have Francis yeah. Collins, who's the head of NIH, who's a conservative evangelical Christian, and partially and the one who discovers the genome. So yeah. a very good point. Uh, but keep in mind here, the God that was excluded here was the God of Genesis. Uh, as I told you in eighteen hundreds. Uh, except in Buffon, for instance, uh, Lamarck, uh, and so on. Uh, it was the biblical record that was dominant at that time. Exceptions, sure. And uh, right now we, we have, a, uh, your point is very good. You've got to define God to a certain extent. The one that was rejected seems to be the God of the Bible. Uh, one of my zoology professors once told me at the University of Virginia, God is nature. That was his definition of God, you know. This is, uh, I think, a, uh, a way to at least, you know, you're, I'm not an atheist. I don't know why atheism uh, some people feel it is repugnant to a certain extent. I, uh, I don't see why it should be, but uh, I think in general people try to avoid this. We have deism that's so very popular, you know, uh, <coughs> among some people. Yeah, there's a God, you know, but he's not active in nature now. Uh, the God that was excluded here is a God that was active in nature type of thing, more like the, you know, the God of the Bible, who's the creator and who sustains nature and so on. So, uh, uh, but you, you, you do, uh, well, the term God is, is a very uh, loose term at present, at present, it wasn't so much then. Any other comments? If there aren't an A, you, folk, oh, you want to make one? Here, we've got to pass this up to you. Most of your uh, research for this, uh, I'm just curious where, what, where you got most of the research, just books, the internet, or a combination, I guess, or? Um, some of it the internet, some of it books. I've been looking at this, you know, for 50 years. Uh, I've got a stack of papers this high uh, on this topic. Uh, I've been wanting to write an article about it. How about a uh, book? What's that? How about a book? Uh, I'll be lucky if I get an article done. <laughs> it, uh, uh, it, it, this book, to a certain extent, covers that. I mean, my state science discovers God. Uh, this is it just the opposite story, folks. <laughs> it's how the scientific data, and, but it, it does include some of the history in there, which is uh, where I got some of the data from, uh, per se. Uh, yeah, and next week's topic, uh, it sounds very interesting. Now, the same thing, same, same answer. But we're, we're going to get from 20th century on. Why are we in this? Uh, and basically, why would science do this? Why would scientists do it and so on? Uh, uh, a tough question. I have some of my own theories on that, but I'm, I'm be very curious to see what yeah, you Yeah, well, uh, no, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, why restrict your area, your area of, of inquiry? Uh, a terrible mistake.
Well, I, I asked the same question with how come United States is so much in so much debt? That's another question. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, which I have <laughs> answers for that one too. But interesting. And in, uh, in the meantime, let's keep malice towards none and charity towards all, folks. God is redemptive. He's trying to save every person, every one of these persons he's trying to save. Keep that in mind. Folks, have a good Sabbath.